Welcome to the United Church of Fayetteville online service. As we participate from the comforts of our home, we welcome the glories of the season. A blanket of new snow paints our world in a radiant white. It's time to appreciate the beauty of this season. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Now is the time for all of us to worship together. Welcome to United Church. People of God, in all the seasons of the earth and all the seasons of the spirit, the Lord our God is present and active in our lives and world. We gather in worship to affirm our trust and have our hope restored. Together, let us worship the Lord. Let us pray together. Amazing God, you are present in every time and circumstance in the great events of the world and in the intimate moments of our lives, for your faithfulness, guidance, and constant work for the upbuilding of all people in reconciliation among nations. We give you our thanks and praise now and forevermore. Amen. Be our glory evermore. Grant us 
Let us listen together to the words of the psalmist. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither, and all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May the psalmist's trust be our own. God's word to us continues today from the Gospel of Luke. Let us listen. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. This is God's word for us today, and God always blesses the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and especially the living of the Holy Word. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, gift us with your spirit that we might find your word and will and intentions in your word, and that we might find ways to demonstrate it in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are just having our first real snow here in Syracuse this winter. While we've had a lot of gray days so far, at least to me, this seems like the beginning of winter. On the other hand, after winding our way through what we may hope is two-thirds of a public health emergency, it has seemed like winter for a while, regardless of the calendar or the weather. It is usually at the end of this month or the early February that we start seeing cartoons about surviving or at least enduring winter. And we will also see lifestyle advice like how to survive cabin fever, getting exercise, exposing oneself to daylight, drinking lots of water, eating a balanced diet, when indoors, when indoors doing things like picking up a book instead of watching TV or another screen, and connecting with other people in meaningful ways. If I'm not mistaken, those are the same things that are recommended not only for how to survive winter and cabin fever, but for how to survive a pandemic, as well as how to avoid any kind of unpleasantness from weight loss, stress, jet lag, visits from in-laws, or major illness. If we add don't smoke and wear a seatbelt, we have the complete canon of contemporary wisdom for how to live long and prosper. It may not just be contemporary guidance, of course. The development of such wisdom has a long history, especially in the annals of our faith. Today's Psalm 1 is known as a wisdom psalm part of the genre of writings that offer sage advice for living. 
It is no accident that it is the first among the Psalms. And its opening words, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the law they meditate day and night. Stand as an invitation to all of us to read, study further, and more deeply embrace a life of faithful living. It suggests that those who accept such an invitation might anticipate being like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. It is true that those who live wisely and fully might indeed prosper always. Yet I imagine that almost everyone has experienced a winter of discontent, a winter of pain, or cares deeply for someone who has. A child is killed by a drunken driver. Despite, despite plenty, people are hungry and homeless. We get cancer. A couple cannot have a child. Love leaves or never comes at all. People are rejected for being who God created them to be. There's violence in the streets. We can't gather with our families or eat out in restaurants. We are not sure whether we are more worried about getting a virus or giving it to someone else. War, ethnic cleansing, and racism loom large. The earth moves, buildings crumble, fires rage. People who are good and faithful and wise and caring and sharing can experience winters so bitter that their gifts wither and atrophy. Their energy and hope shrivel away to nothing. Their life's blood ceases to flow through their broken hearts and every solution they reach for slips through their fingers like water. What do we do when it seems that wisdom is turned inside out? When we get not what we deserve, but what we've striven hard to avoid? When all is chaos instead of running according to God's created order? Is it only our world that has betrayed us, or has our faith's wisdom lied to us as well? We might turn to the winter image of a tree, branches stripped of its leaves, waiting for a new day. In the midst of such winters, like trees, we're not growing, we're not budding, stretching, or bearing fruit. Rather, we find ourselves in a season of waiting, resting, enduring, and preparing. At such times, we would do well to remember that very few trees bare of leaves and fruit, die of their winters. As a model for exploring our faith, the, imageries, the imagery of trees, trees that fruit and those that wither, the ones that provide shelter and those that protect themselves with thorns, flow throughout scripture, from the tree of life to our psalm, to Jesus' parables, to even Paul's letters. Following their example, using that image, meditating, reflecting, and praying can reveal to us not the falseness of faith in the providence of a loving God, but the wisdom to survive the winters that come even with such faith. For those of us who try to follow wisdom's advice for organizing our lives, the powerlessness and vulnerability brings its own pain. In his old book, The Ragamuffin Gospel, Brendan, Brendan Manning wrote, our spirituality often starts with self, not God. Personal responsibility has replaced personal response. We focus on overcoming our weaknesses, getting rid of our hangups. We set sweat through various spiritual exercises as if they were designed to create some kind of Christian athlete. We believe we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Manning suggests that our constant striving, our faithful aerobics, are a reflection of our inability to trust in the furious love of God that pursues us relentlessly. Our commitment to self-improvement can make it difficult to accept that God bathes us in sheer grace that is poured over every moment of our living. Manning continues, Sooner or later, we are confronted with the painful truth of our inadequacy and insufficiency. 
Our security is shattered and our bootstraps cut. For some Christians, life then becomes one long January. Winter. We're trapped in frozen ground while its bitter winds shake us at the roots of our illusion that we are in control. We stand in the open while its sleeting rain slashes our conviction that life is fair. We keen our grief heavenward. We shriek our anger for those who don't get what they deserve. And we moan our sense of betrayal over those who get what we too deserve. There is a long and faithful tradition for such responses. The voices of those who have become disoriented and disillusioned by public and private crises echo throughout the Psalms of Lament, the Book of Lamentations, the Books of Job and Ecclesiastes. They weave together to form the, with the Wisdom Psalms and the Proverbs to form what is called Wisdom Literature, very helpful resources for meditation and prayer in winter times of the Spirit, especially for those of us who wonder if faithful people get angry with God or with the world. These writings are not afraid of our emotions, nor should we be. These writings help us give voice to our own feelings. But just as importantly, they paint a broader vision of God's presence in all seasons of life. They can deepen our understanding of psalms like today's, that in difficult times seem to convict those who are suffering. The people who wrote, saved, and prayed these words of wisdom were neither blind nor foolish. They were the same ones who wrote of pain and loss. They were the same ones who raged at the heavens. They could see as well as we that bad things happen to good people and very good things happen to shallow people. What is wicked for the psalmist is all that gets in the way of fulfilling God's intentions. In this fuller context, such words as happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, are not self-righteous. They are not affirmations of resources that they are affirmations of resources that undergird every circumstance of life. They are not words of vindication, confirming for those who are happy that they have earned their happiness. And they do not allow pious finger pointing at those who life has treated less kindly. Nor are they words of judgment, condemning every one of us who isn't perfect, and that is every one of us. Mouthed, echoed, prayed, in good times and in bad, they can become words of celebration, celebration of an intended order of life created by God. They are recognition and remembrance that even when our world is shaken to its roots, God's intention for us is good. Woven into our prayers of grief, pain, loss, or anger, the wisdom and truth of our faith, affirming God's good purposes, can help us to be survivors of the winter. They can help to transform unbearable grief into bearable sorrow. Winters when we get what we do not deserve are a reminder that personal effort isn't a guarantee of blessing. It never was the source of blessing either. It is by God's grace alone, from God's hand alone, that we, do all, that we have all that we have, including the gift of faith itself. Winter wisdom can further our faithfulness when winter is past, for it works to restore in us an absolute wonder at God's good grace in every season. In the midst of our bleakest winter, Faith holds out the reminder that winter is but one season and one that does not destroy all that is. Winter is not death. We can be changed by our winters, scarred perhaps, disabled maybe, stronger in some ways, hopefully. But whether it is in this life or the next, no winter can celebrate us from the separate us from the love of God in Christ. Or that not the truth. Would God have sent a son whose touch poured healing power into the lives of people in extraordinary winters of leprosy, poverty, illness, isolation, or shame?
Our faith holds out for us our hope for care in the midst of winter and the seasons that flow after it. The hope of our faith is not an airbrush that paints over the disfiguring marks of our humanity. Our hope is not rose-colored glasses denying the very real possibilities of loss and death. Rather, the hope of our faith is, as William Sloan Coffin wrote in the days after his son's death, hope alone cannot prevent tragedy, but it can prevent tragedy from becoming irredeemable. I have found heaven in the depths of hell. I have found that no circumstance of life can exclude the presence of God. In every misfortune, there is grace sufficient to enable all believers so minded to say with St. Paul, perplexed, but not driven to despair, struck down, but not destroyed. So wrote Coffin. With such hope, it is possible to be a survivor of winter. It is the hope, it is the wisdom of our faith that calls us when we are experiencing a winter of discontent. It is this hope that leads the church to be the church in every time and place. It is hope that draws us as it did those who came to Jesus so long ago. We come to him to be healed of our diseases and we who are troubled come to be cured. All of us are trying to touch him, for the power that comes from him can heal us all. In our worship, and indeed in all our life together, we rehearse and proclaim the truth that winter's desolation is not God's purpose for us. It is this hope that we sing, preach, pray, baptize, eat, and drink, so that God's furious love comes into being wherever we are and wherever we serve. And over time, by the wisdom of God and the spirit of God, we are transformed, survivors all, into a community of praise. May it be so for us now and always. Amen. Oh,
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you in prayer, seeking your blessings on the creation, the world, our nation, and our lives of faith and family. As our nation inaugurated a new administration, we are freshly aware that the works of healing, hope, recovery, justice, and the offering of mercy belong not to them alone, but require the effort of every one of us. We are aware that in the lives of nations and the lives of people, there are no clean slates, no page to begin where nothing has been written before. However, that is not an excuse for failing to begin again, for declining to work to make things better, or to retire in cynicism or anger. Fill our spirits, Lord, we pray, with the hope and faithfulness we have in you, the commitment to working toward your purposes for all people, and building relationships of trust and possibility with our neighbors near and far. We pray with these words, with the silent meditations of our hearts, and with the prayer Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Glory. Go. Oh.